Welcome to the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sorelli. I'm proud to partner with Pendleton Whiskey. Pendleton Whiskey just released its fourth annual We've Got Your Six limited edition military bottle to honor veterans of the United States Armed Forces. Pendleton Whiskey is also pledged to donate $100,000 of proceeds to support the Bob Woodruff Foundation. The Bob Woodruff Foundation helps create healthy, positive futures for our service members, veterans, and their families. Remember to go to PendletonWhiskey.com and please check out their cocktails page, which provides a Western spin on your classic cocktails. All right, let's get to it. Welcome, John. It is so damn good to have you on here. And I know we were talking Thank before you. we uh, recorded here, but this is like a trip down memory lane because I grew up on uh, on your music. And when this came through, they said, hey, do you want to interview John Resnick? It's like, why are you even asking? You know the answer. And I started going back and just listening to all the songs. And I'm like, it reminds me of this time in high school or this time in my early days in the military. Uh, pretty wicked how we tie a, uh, a memory to a specific st- sort of song in our life. Yeah. Yeah. It is, ama- it is amazing that that happens, that there's there's – Music is definitely, it marks time in our lives, you know? Do, do you have that a lot? back people, memories. Do, do people come up a lot and they're like, hey, that one song reminds me of this time in my life, help me, help me get through this period or whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Those, are the, those are the best moments to me. Those are the most gratifying moments of, of what I'm doing or trying to do is when I'll meet somebody at a meet and greet or at a show or, or, or just on the street and they'll be like, man – that song really helped me. You know, I had, I was having a bad time in high school and, and, uh, or whatever. And, and, and that song really spoke to me. And that to me, that's like, wow, something that came out of my brain connected with this person. And, and I was actually able to be there for somebody in a weird way, like a tiny little way, but at least it was something that, that helped them hang on or, or it reminds them of a great time in their life, whatever, you know, is whatever it, the circumstance. Is that like fuel for you? Cause I know you probably just, that's, I mean, that's impact yeah. at its finest. Does that just, do you walk away from that and you're like, okay, we got to keep on going. We got to write more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I walk away from that and it's like, you hope you you're able to retain a, a, a little bit of that empathy, you know, and it, it does help when somebody says, Hey man, what you do, is good, you know, and that was, that was always one of the things that when we were coming up in music, the people, the older people, I always listened to the, the old school music guys, you know, anybody who was a generation or two generations behind me, I wanted, I wanted to learn from them because these people were very successful. And, um, and, um, so, you know, and they would say things like, look, if you're going to create art, or you're going to make music or do whatever you're doing, uh, or you're going to go out and you're going to make a billion dollars in the stock market, try to leave the world a little bit better than you found it. Just a little bit, you know? And I, and, and that's something that I've, I've, I've tried to take to heart, you know? I mean, you know, there's music that's medicine, there's music that's candy, and there's music that's poison, just like people, you know? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Break that down for me. Give me examples there of what you consider amongst the three. I've never heard that, but I do. I think I do know where okay. you're going. Well, like some music, you know, it's like there are people in my life who are medicine to me. I call them when I'm in trouble. Now I have to make sure I also call them when I'm doing well. So they're not like, Jesus Christ, the only time you ever call me is when you're having a problem. But uh, um, but there are people in my life who are, are medicine. And there are people in my life who are like candy. And I and I hang with them and talk to them when I just want to have a good time. Um, and then there's people that are poison and those are the, those are the telephone numbers that you lose, you know, delete. But we've all hung with poison from time to time, probably earlier in our lives yeah. than, than later. Earlier in our lives where we're, we're, uh, you know, I, I have to admit, I mean, because, you know, I'm an addict and a recovering addict and, and alcoholic and, and, Sometimes the poison people are the most fun, you know, especially when you're in that state of mind. You don't understand how toxic they are, but 
but uh, because you're so toxic yourself, because I was so toxic myself. You know? Yeah, as you're saying that, man, now I'm thinking of my 37 to about 40 until I turned 40, uh, coming off a divorce, leaving the military, uh, hanging with a, and I don't, I want to be careful not to call them poison. But they were a fun group. It's just their lives revolved around the bar Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night to where it was just – after two years of that, yeah. I just had a break free. So I, I want to go back because, you know, rarely do people know about the history of high-profile musicians such as yourself, uh, you know, sports stars. But uh, one, you were born in uh, Buffalo, New York, which yeah. I don't know if you're a Buffalo Bills fan, but, man uh, – you guys just can't seem to uh, to pull it out, dude. I mean, you know, yeah, that was that was rough. That was rough in the '90s. We, we sort of, my heart broke over and over and over again for uh, you know for my town, you know, because because the Bills are like everything, you know, and the city. You know, I love my city, and it's always going to be my home. And my whole family still lives there, and I'm up there like six, seven times a year. Um, and it's coming back in this really amazing way. It's like people in Buffalo are, are, are naturally a hard workers, be honest and, and, uh, see they, they have the ability to adapt and, and, and reinvent themselves. And that's, what's going on now. This ma major reinvention of the whole place. And, and you're seeing the arts and, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship just growing exponentially in this place. And it's great to see it because people are doing it themselves and they're finally getting a little help from from the, the local government and, and all that, you know. That's good to hear, man. That's good to hear. Um, so you were the youngest. Did I get this right? Your, your older siblings are all girls? Your sisters? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they say, they say, oh, you're the baby. It's like, yeah. no, I'm not the baby. I'm the last kid. By the time I came around, my parents were so burnt. <laughs> you know, it was like my sisters had to take care of me most of the time. You know? And quite literally, they did towards the end. Um, when you were 15 and 16, you, you lost your mom or your father and your, your mother, uh, respectively, back to back. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Okay, for a 15, 16 year old, my, my biggest drama in life was uh, probably a girl breaking up with me. I mean, how does a 15, 16 year old, I mean, you lose your father and you probably, yeah. you know, not that you're getting over that, but a year later you lose your mom as well. I mean, bro, walk me through that. Um, well, it was, I, I was, um, when that happened with my mom, and I actually was, holding her in my arms when she passed and um i don't know it was like it was shock really and i remember it was like i remember they had to take her to the hospital and then and um you know she was obviously already gone and um so uh it was like i remember going to bed that night really really late and I just kept putting more and more blankets on me, but I, cause I, I couldn't get warm, you know? Um, it was really a freaky situation. Um, and I was quite honestly, I was like, you know, we were broke. I mean, we were, we were so poor. It's like, well, yeah, where are you going to go? You know? So there was, there was a brief period of time where I was like hopping around to friends, homes and things like that. And like, you know, before I could get it together, it was really, it was really difficult. Um, you know, but one of the, one of the most amazing, brilliant things about being that young and, and being, being caught up in, in, in this pretty crazy situation is that, that I was, I was able to go, okay, this is bad and this sucks and my heart is broken, but I have to keep going. And I think that was, it taught me a really important lesson in retrospect, you know, and it, and it really was, it's like, you don't have a choice, man. You get, you either get up or die. So get up and go, you know, and that, that was really became a motivating factor.
in my life. And I had, you know, and I, I, I didn't have a lot of resources. We didn't have any money. Um, you know, and you just kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, adapt and, and, and make it work. You don't have a choice. So what do you do? Again, for a 15 or 16 year old, that's a pretty mature outlook. Did your parents raise you that way to always pick yourself up by the bootstraps, get back after it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause we, we didn't really have anything when we were growing up, you know, there were five kids. My dad was a mailman. My mom was a school teacher. Um, you know, and it was, it was, uh, yeah, we weren't like starving, but you know, I mean, we didn't have anything. Um, and, and my dad, my dad, my, it's really kind of, my dad was older. He was, he was actually, he was at the end of world war two. He was in the Navy oh, wow. and yeah. When it was like, you know, all my friends, dads, they were like, you know, Korea, Vietnam, those kind of things. But, um, he got, he was, he was a dark individual. You know, my dad, my dad was very kind of a dark guy. And he would tell me, it was like, he was preparing me. Like we would, we would be, cause we were the only two males in the house. So we had to get the hell out of there. Sometimes he would be like, get in the car. We're getting out of here. Cause it was all women. And, um, and so, and he would tell me things like, listen, I'm not always going to be here. I'm not always going to be here. I'm not going to hold your hand. I can't take care of you. You know, you got to learn to take care of yourself. You got to learn to take care of yourself. You know, and it was like, and my mother was very much so like, come here, I'm going to show you how to sew a button on your shirt. So you don't need a woman to do this for you. You know, this is not what women are for. So I'm going to teach you how to do the laundry. I'm going to teach you how to cook. I'm going to teach you how to take care of yourself. And it was like, in a strange way, the way you phrased that, it just sparked this memory of, of, of just, yeah. Yeah. The, the whole time I was growing up, it was like, it was like going to Boy Scout camp. They're like teaching me survival skills, you know? It's amazing now that you look back, it's, they were preparing you, not that they knew what was coming, but uh, no. you've got to be appreciative I think that. my dad did though. Yeah. I think my dad did though, because he was, he was very, he was, he was a hardcore alcoholic. But once again, that guy was an everyday warrior because I don't know how you get up every morning at four 30 in the morning, go to work, carry mail, work at the post office and then drink a quart of whiskey and then get up and do it every day for 20 something years. And, and, but as dark as he was, he, he took care of his family. And that, that's, that's what growing up in a place like Buffalo is like, you take care of your family, no matter what, you know, and he did until, until he just couldn't anymore. And the disease got him, yeah. you know, that was a hard generation. That was a generation when you look oh, at it. Hell yeah. So, you know, I'm wildly proud of my generation. We went to war for close to 20 years, mm-hmm. but that generation faced a level of combat that far exceeds what we saw on the battlefield. I mean, far exceeds. I mean, they lost hundreds uh, on DU Day alone in a matter of minutes uh, yeah, in comparison yeah. to our war. But they just came home. You know what they did? They got to work. And, uh, yeah, they got to work. I think there was an unhealthy aspect as we, we, we start to talk about mental health. Is they compartmentalize that, though. Very few of them yeah. ever talked about it. Even my grandfather, who was third day of Normandy, and he was the, in the Black Forest during uh, the Battle of the Bulge, never spoke about it. Wow. They just internalized Isn't that, it. that – that was – well, what was – I mean, that was – that's the way that generation was, though. It's like, that's in the past. Forget about it. We got to move forward. I think that there's a certain element of that that – I mean, it's like a survival skill – in a way, don't you think? I don't know. what. Why do you think that generation was wired that way? You know, I, I couldn't give you a good answer. And I could say the way you just framed it, there's probably both good and bad with that. Yeah. There yeah. definitely was a, 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 I would say, a higher element of emotional strength, mental strength within that generation. Is that is that called grit or is that mental toughness or what, you know? 
I don't think they're mutually exclusive, in, in my opinion. Right. I, I think emotional strength is very much a part of, uh, of grit. But we, I mean, we have seen, but it's also, you know, so I've got a good clinical psychologist friend who says, you know, mental health issues have increased exponentially since World War II. And of course, the diagnosis of mental health is subjective. Uh, if I come into a doctor yeah. and say, hey, I have mental health issues, they can't say, no, you don't. Um, I, I, I do agree with people being more vulnerable, uh, discussing mm -hmm. their problems, because that's the best way to get through them. But there, there has to be an element of that greatest generation, that, that grit that we instill back into our society. And again, that's my opinion of regardless if you have mental health issues. And first off, let me tell you this. Somebody said it great. Mental health issues does not mean mental weakness. Like people no, are now lumping those. See, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's like, you know, I think so. I think, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think if my father was able to talk about his experiences, because you know he lost his father when he was very, very young, and my aunts, his sisters, told me, you know, they told me all the stories about when they were growing up, kids, and uh, I was like, my grandfather was crazy, um, and and I, in retrospect, again, you know, it's like, oh, I understand why my father was so dark, you know, because he grew up in a screwed up situation but but um yeah I, I i think but he you you carry on that's all i i lost my train of thought for a second i apologize um you know i think you do need to open up and you need to be helped but you but i i think that the problem because like i went to therapy for like and i still go to therapy in little blocks of time um but I think there has to be a solution focus. You have to aim towards towards a solution. And the problem with therapy now is I think people just use it as a crutch. And it's like you're sitting there for five years and you're like, what is the end game here? You know, the end game is is to have a better life. And, it, it, you know, um, and I think people just kind of sit there and, and whine and bitch and, and nothing gets done. It's like we need to find solutions and I think a lot of the solution I was I was reading an article about a guy in Laos, okay? And this guy, this is about mental health. This guy was working in the rice paddies. He stepped on a landmine, lost his leg. They got him a prosthetic leg. He he was in so much pain he could not work in the rice paddy. So instead of giving him pills and and just, you know, a check every month or whatever, um, his, his little, uh, village, they sat down and they talked with him. Right. And they found out what can this guy do? And they bought him a cow and that, and then he became a dairy farmer and his purpose was restored. I think that our, as, as human beings, we need purpose. And there seems to be now in the modern world of the future, I think there's an epidemic of loneliness, especially among men, disenfranchisement, um, you know, um, that old, that old message of shut up and just persevere. I, you know, it, there's a component of that that's necessary, but you also need to have people to talk to. You need, you need your tribe. It, it's kind of strange, you know? Because you you do you need your tribe, it, so I, I couldn't agree with you more. There is, and I think COVID accelerated it. In, in my opinion, is everyone was isolated, and especially for somebody who yeah. is maybe single in New York, living in a uh, four hundred square foot apartment, if they're lucky, yeah. uh, felt so closed off from the rest of the world. I believe in the concept of tribe, and yes, when we use that word, it's not cultural uh, appropriation. There were no. tribes in the, in, the no. in Europe, Asia, all well beyond, uh, you know, North America. Um, right. But we all need a sense of homecoming and belonging. That's why I love the military so much. It, it was a it was a brotherhood yeah. and a sisterhood, and you had a sense sure. of purpose. We knew why we existed, yeah. and it wasn't to go to war and kill people. Mm -hmm. That was the, the 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 hopefully the the, the thing we could avoid. It was right. to let's say, give a presence of strength that nobody would want to go to war with us. Um, 
Right. But you also bring up something that I think is the, and it's not a pandemic because it's not global, but I think within the United States, there's this epidemic of victimhood that, Mm. so you talk like people just want to talk for five years about the problems. There has to be a point. Talk is good, but that has to transform into action at some point. But I think with social media today, people can just sort of stay a victim. They say, Hey, I've, I've suffered this and I'm a victim. And what does everyone do? They applaud them. So what are they doing the next week? Yeah. Oh, something else happened to me. And this is a shame. And I'm a victim. Oh, we're so sorry for you. And they just, so yeah. they're getting that. I, I call it negative, uh, you know, affirmation. And so they just stay in the victim right. category. Yeah. Well, I think, I think in general, yeah, I think in general now that that is kind of the thing. It's like the 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 we all feel like victims sometimes, you know, and we all love to feel sorry for ourselves on occasion. It's an indulgence. It's it's an indulgence that can become very addictive, you know. And um, you got to be careful of it. I think I I try to be careful of it. Um, but yeah, where is the solution? It's like I want to know. It's like. Why am I, why am I sad all the time? Why do I feel like, like, you know, my wife doesn't understand, whatever, you know, it could be, I'm just making stuff up. Why is this happening? What can I do about it? And how do I get to a better place? That's what I want to know. And I think that's where a lot of therapy goes wrong because it's not, it's not solution oriented, you know, and, and, and there are, there are new forms of, of therapy, you know, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that, that are very proactive and try to, in, you know, integrate you in, you know, back into life. Now there are, you know, there are things that I wanted to talk to you about as being in probably the most elite, intense group of military people. There is a whole psychological level that goes into that. And you're, you know, where where you were you brought up an interesting point you want to have enough strength so that nobody wants to screw with us you know and that's to present that kind of strength but at the same time it's a collective strength and you're i don't know how you mean you know we're very into self-reliance but we're but the interdependence between you and your fellow soldiers warriors that's something that's that's a bond that's so important and i think i think and that's why i always played in bands like playing music that's my tribe you know and wherever i get together with musicians there that's my tribe and i know that i can talk to these people you know and i'm and i am part of something and i am not alone you know, so when you talk about it, it's funny. And I've got this sort of this is how I, I paint it when people ask. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you have a collective group around you that all have the same sense of purpose. And I do want to discuss another another thing with that, that I've, I've come because I've, I've had a lot of time to reflect on my military experience. So you guys performed at an elite level. We performed at an elite level. We were all tribes. But so is the Hell's Angels. So is ISIS. Mm-hmm. So is Al Qaeda. Those are tribes as well. Yeah. And my point right. where I'm going with that is just make sure that your tribe is putting good into the world, not, not, not evil. Um, but yeah. everyone, you know, even ISIS, Al Qaeda, the Hell's Angels, also offers a form of homecoming and belonging to to a young impoverished kid who who's never been part of a group. And to to them, that's that's like a drug. They're like, I've never had this, and now I belong to this this group, regardless if they're a criminal organization or or or, or a nonprofit. Um, but uh, what I, yeah. what I did yeah. realize, I've come to realize this is, uh, you know, I always talk about how we, I, I led through love in the military and, and a lot of guys led the same way. Um, cause I'll tell you, I loved my men and women a lot more than I hated the enemy on, on the other side of the battlefield. Uh, and that's what, what drove right. me. But, uh, people are like, oh, then you must've just liked every single guy in your team. And I'm like, oh no, 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 not at all. Like I love them. But uh, I didn't like all of them, yeah. and some of them didn't like me. It, but we could come together, put our needs aside for the good of the group, identify, mm-hmm. hey, what's the objective we need to achieve this week or this day? And then come Friday, that person went their direction with their circle of friends. I went mine. And, and I mean, we remained professional and tactful, but uh, 
there is a difference between love and liking. It doesn't mean you need to like it. It's like your family. You, you know, you love all yeah. your family members. You may not like your your sister as much as you like yeah. your brother, but uh, I mean, it's still your sister and bro- right. brother. And no, I'm not saying that I love my brother more than I love my sister. I, I don't want, I don't want to get a phone call after this. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what I mean, man? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. So um, let's let's jump into the music though, because I, you you went through serious obstacles. You overcame serious obstacles in, in the early part of your life. Um, mm-hmm. You went to college for a, sh- a short stint. Is that, is that accurate? It, yeah. 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 I flunked. <laughs> so did I, my, my first experience. Yeah, that's why yeah. I enlisted in the Marine Corps. But uh, when did you, you decide, Hey, call Jane for me or these other things ain't for me. I'm full in on, on the music. What was it about the, that drew you in that, that, that's, you know, sparked that passion dude behind uh, music. What was, I mean, it was really kind of the only thing I was good at, you know, um, compared to, you know, I, you know, I, I wasn't really the academic type, I guess at that point, you know, I mean, I, I was more interested in, you know, meeting girls and playing music and that and college was kind of getting in the way of all that. So when I was asked to leave the university, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I had, I had met Robbie and we were determined that we were going to do something. We were determined that we were going to do something great, you know, um, you know, and, 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 you know, we still meet up every day on tour. We still meet up every day in the morning for coffee. And we discuss what's going on. And this is 35 years later, you know. What, what does Robbie mean to you? Because I, I, I know you've been married and divorced. You're married now. You have a little girl. But it seems like yeah. Robbie is the most consistent staple of your life. Yeah. Um, you know, we got days where we don't like each other, but we love each other. Um, you know, just like everybody. Uh there's times we really don't agree. And there's times, you know, there are, t- <laughs> there are times, you know, I've said I pushed the right button and, you know, he jumped across a coffee table and tried to kill me, you know? So not really, but, you know, he wanted, you know, he, you know, he wanted to, you know, punch my head in, but, uh, you know, that's, you know, that happens with brothers all the time. You know, and he's very much my brother in, in, in a lot of ways. And it's, it's, uh, he has been, probably the most stable person in my life. Now, Robbie grew up in a house where his dad, who's an awesome guy, he was a, a, a he was an MP. And so basically his job was to beat up drunk soldiers. You know? so, so it's like, okay, a very tough disciplinarian and, um, you know, and I think that, that, you know, Robbie is one of the guys, he won't give up. No, no, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. And there's times where I want to pack it in and just be like, I'm done. This is ridiculous. Um, and he's like, come on, man, let's just, let's just ride it out. And he, he was able, he was able to get us. Like, I always think of what we've done. The path that we've taken is you got to look for your little victories and you got to hang on to those and use those to propel you to the next little victory because all success is built on failure after failure after failure after failure. And you have to look at your, not you, I have to look at my failures as a stepping stone to the next victory, you know, and nothing, nothing is the only way I fail is if I quit, you know, that's the only thing I can do. I got you. Get up, get up. You get knocked down 10 times, you get up 11 times. That's how you win. John, you were correct when you said you. With regards to me, that's everyone, dude, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to reframe the way you look at failure. It's part of the process. It's not, it's not an indication that you're not capable of achieving whatever goal you've set out. It's just an indication that you may be doing right. it the wrong way and you've got to make these, 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 exactly. these, these changes. But what, I mean, we've all heard the, the quote from Edison. Hey, I didn't uh, discover the uh, light bulb. I, fa- I found like 10,000 ways not to, uh, to, to do it. 
or did, yeah, did that yeah, wrong? yeah, no, I, I was actually, I was thinking of that when you, when, and you said that that's incredible. F- failure is yeah. the most beautiful thing in life. I think, um, it, in, we just, well, I, you know, George Silva who helped coordinate this and that guy's like my right hand man, a guy named Jason Belay and a guy named Brian, uh, Gordon, uh, we just finished up a book. We just finished the manuscript called The Everyday Warrior, a no-hack practical approach to, uh, cool. to life. And we talk heavily about victimhood and we talk heavily about failure uh, because my life is one. And we said it right before this. We we're like, what is the, the biggest failure in your life? It's my life. It's like one long error chain of uh, yeah. things. And I occasionally, for every 10 things I get wrong, I get one thing right. Um, but yeah. people have to reframe the way they, they look at failure. And it, it is the it is life's yeah, greatest manner. I agree. In my opinion, again, it's. I mean, you know what? I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, sometimes it's hard to swallow because of our ego. You know, it's like you need ego to do things, but there's healthy ego and there's and there's there's destructive ego, and and you know you you gotta have you gotta have some some ego to get up on stage in front of people or you, you know, you, and you got to have, I'm not going to call it ego. I'm going to call it what it is balls to do what you did. <laughs> like, like I'm dealing with, with, you know, entertainment. You, I mean, you, you, what you do is much was what you were doing was much more serious. Wait, John, let me put it to you this way. You know? I would be more nervous stepping in front of a crowd. What's the biggest crowd you've played? 150,000 people. Okay, first off, that's insane. <laughs> I would be more nervous that's stepping nuts. in front of 150,000 people than stepping onto the battlefield. It's different for different people. It's like public speaking. I sucked at public right. speaking early on, and now now it's become more natural. Yeah. Um, so it, in the in the vein of, of failure, let me, let me ask two questions. You said music was the only thing you were good at. Was that innate mm-hmm. or was it because you worked your freaking ass off? Um, I believe that it was it, – I was born with it. I was born with it because I never took any music lessons really except for accordion. Um, I believe it was innate. But that being said, you got to work. You got to do the work. And I know I have this five-year-old little girl and I go and I tell her all the time because I wish somebody would have said this to me. And I tell her, look at me, look at me, Lily. You have greatness inside you, but you got to do the work. And I know it's heavy for a five-year-old, but I just want to keep instilling that in her mind that she's got to do the work. I know tons of people who are considered geniuses and they can't get off their ass and get anything done. And it's like, yeah, you're a genius, but you're nothing but potential. It's like we all have potential. We have to release the kinetic energy inside ourselves. We have to take action to get shit done, like it says here in your thing. It's like you have to take you have to take at some point in time. I this is how I learned how to swim, okay? One of my sister's boyfriends threw me in the deep end of the pool. Just threw me in the pool. And I was terrified after that because I almost drowned, you know, and, and luckily someone saved me and I was a little kid. And then, um, and then I was terrified of swimming. So what I had to do, what I had to do to get over that anxiety and that fear was, it was the first time we went out on tour and we were staying in these crap motels and we had, wherever there was a swimming pool, I would, I would throw myself into the deep end of the pool, but I would always have my hand against the wall. So I knew that I could get out, but I had to keep exposing myself to that fear and that anxiety until it didn't affect me. I had to desensitize myself, you know, because, because someone traumatized me. So I felt as though I needed to, I felt the only path for me to get over this fear was to move through it and get to the other side of it. It's, it's so again, man, it's, it's, I love this because you haven't read this book and you're basically walking through the entire book we just wrote about risk. Now, when I say the word risk mm-hmm. and, and let me know if you think this is accurate, most people think fear and you have to, to, again, yeah. much like 
um, failure and changing your mindset, you, you have to look at the upside of risk. No risk, no reward. But yeah. that doesn't mean you go and throw yourself into the deep end of the pool. Like what you just said, you, yeah. you take small little incremental steps of exposing yourself to more risk until you don't need to keep your hands on the wall anymore. And that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm, now I'm fine in a swimming pool. You know, I mean, I was like, we were in a plane crash uh, in Sicily. We were doing, um, we were doing um, uh, like a USO tour. And we went to Bahrain and all these crazy places. And uh, and we got to play rock music on an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. It was pretty crazy. Awesome. Um, and then and then we were flying back and we had to go through Sicily. And the plane crashed, like legit crashed. And and uh, I, I, had to get, I was like, I'm never getting on an airplane again. And then, but I had to, get, I got really drunk, got on an airplane, came back to the States. And I was like, that's it. I'm done flying. But what I had to do, because I'm like, well, wait a minute, if you're going to do your job, you've got to fly. So you better get over this fear. So I went skydiving and I, I, I had a guy s- strapped to my back and, and I'm like, dude, let's go. And what out the airplane screaming, freaking out. But it was cathartic in a way, because when that chute opened and we were drifting down and it was beautiful and if i hadn't taken that risk i wouldn't have gotten that wide perspective and it became a metaphor in my life to to keep going you know and you know it's and those are the kind of challenges that we have to do if i'm afraid to talk to someone i have to go talk to that person you know and they may reject me i think that's my biggest fear in life is rejection but you got to learn to swallow it and accept it as a stepping stone to success or acceptance. You know? that, that is so beautiful, man. And first off, I would rather jump out of an airplane than fly. Flying scares the hell out of me. But I jump out of, uh, you know, so I don't know if you knew this. So I, I'm a tandem master. I can take people uh, skydiving and, and strap them to the front of me. But um, that is the weirdest thing, man, is I'm more comfortable skydiving than I am. Yeah. And I think it's a control issue. I think because I'm not a pilot. Yeah. I'm not in control. You, 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 it's it's amazing we step onto planes every day, and it's almost like, pilot, I hope you're well-trained and do your job well. Uh, you really are putting your hands into yeah. to, to somebody else's life, but um, it's also a very regulated in, industry. Uh, I, dude, that is my biggest fear, a plane crash. That That's insane. Every, everyone walk away? Everyone walked away. But what was crazy was the guy had to keep I'll, – I'll do this really quick because there's more important things – the guy had to circle around till he was pretty much out of gas, you know, out of fuel. And, um, and so I had a lot of time to think about what I was going to do. Like, okay, we're going down and we had time to think about it. So I'm like, okay, it's the fire, not the crash that kills most people. So it's like, I'm putting a leather jacket over my head and like, okay, so the leather jacket's going to protect my face from the fire and I'm going to like get out of the, and it was just, it was chaos. It was it was chaos, and it was nuts. And, and you know, it's it's a bit of trauma, you know, in a way. I think this is something that I I'm just going to say that I think like I have I've been to a few therapists in my life, and over the past few years, you know, you have to tell your story to the therapist. Boom! Instantly, they diagnose me with PTSD, and I'm like, hold on, hold on. Like, like, I think that PTS, uh, PTSD in, you know, the civilian population, it's a little bit overdiagnosed, I think, because I'm like, I'm like, well, maybe I do have P- PTSD because, you know, uh, I don't know. But I've seen people who have real PTSD and my little annoyances and neuroses don't stack up to what that really is. I just have annoying, I'm just annoying and neurotic at times, you know, and these are, these are challenges that the universe is putting in front of me to, to overcome, to get to the next place. I will say that post-traumatic stress can lead to growth, though, post-traumatic growth. I think it can, but, but what is going on inside my mind 
doesn't even qualify when you when you've seen someone who has been through battles and who 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 has really been their life has been at risk and 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 it's uh, uh, someone thing. who was you know sexually or emotionally abused as, as a child yeah that that is serious trauma um but with the right yeah. help they can absolutely turn that into uh, to growth you did say it earlier man and i believe you know just because somebody is a qualified shrink or a psychologist does not mean they're good at what they do it's like musicians. They're great musicians. And then there are musicians that are not that good. It depends on the person. And you said it. Is that person moving yeah. you towards a solution? I don't think all shrinks and uh, psychologists uh, do that. No, no. I've met uh, – I lived in Los Angeles for a long time. So there's no shortage of bizarre characters. And, um, you know, and I had I had, a, I had a therapist I was smoking pot with and, and like – going over to his house and I'm just like, well, what is the end game here? And I just felt like, well, you just want my 200 bucks an hour to like hang out. It's like, this is not healthy. This is a bad relationship. So, you know, the, you know, and to, and the thing is when, when you're in a vulnerable position, there's no shortage of people who are going to try to take advantage of that. And that's why I think it's, it's the, you know, people who really are suffering with PTSD and things like that, they really need to be cared for by people that can be trusted, you know, because, and I found that too in the, in the, in the, uh, recovery community. Um, there are a lot of people trying to make a buck off, off of my disease or my, my illness or whatever you want to call it. And, and that's why I've been very wary of where I go in my sobriety to, to get help, to find my community, to help find my tribe of drunks that I can, that we can help each other through this and stay sober because there's people who want to exploit you. Iron sharpens iron. So is one man sharpens another. You definitely have to find the right group that wants to heal and move forward. Or if not, misery loves company and they just want yeah. to keep you down with themselves because they don't want to put the work in. But exactly. So, John, exactly. You, you hit some dark times in terms of substance abuse. Yeah. Did you ever pinpoint through your healing process? This is why I was using this to mask this, or this is why I became dependent on it. Was it the stress of the job? Was it the environment? What, what, did, what, what, what conclusions did you come to? Um, I was afraid of everything. Everything, even though even though I would get up and face it every day, I was terrified of everything, you know, and, you know, and, and just just plagued with self-doubt and worry. And and I couldn't deal with it. And and the fact that I had grown up in really in 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 a pretty crazy environment, it was pretty nuts. My dad's an alcoholic and. Life at home was pretty crazy sometimes. And, um, you know, and I truly believe if he, had, if he had gotten the right help, he would still be here. Um, but anyway, all that aside, but um, it caused me a lot, a lot of fear that I couldn't control. And the only, and I'll tell you why people use alcohol and drugs, because they work <laughs> until they don't. Until they don't. And then somebody said this to me and I thought it was really brilliant. They're like, the man takes the drink, the drink takes the drink, the drink takes the man. And yeah, it was like the saddest time in my life. The saddest time in my life was wanting, was being drunk as hell and and on drugs and just wanting so desperately to be clean. And not being able to do it. And I truly believe that the universe helped me and some people that, that it, care about me. Was it you that came really to the conclusion me. that you needed help or was it those close to you that say, hey, John, we've, we've, this, yeah. this has got to stop or both? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a real addict because when they tried to do the intervention thing on me, oh. I laughed. I was like, I was like, I was sitting on my sofa in my underwear, just laughing. I'm like, I love you guys, but.
but this is bullshit, and I'm not doing it. I'll tell you what. I made a deal just to get him out of my house, just to get everybody that loved me out of my house. I was like, I'll go to rehab, but I'm going to stay drunk for the next three days, okay? Is that a deal? That's a deal. Cool. Get out of my house. I'm going to get loaded. And um, and then I did. And then I went to rehab, and it didn't work. I had to go to rehab five times, you know, before I committed to it, you know? And, and then I had to spend three months there. I wish I could have spent six, but but I spent three. And what I learned, though, is nothing – Nothing is going to make me quit until I decide I'm going to do it. And and I when I'm talking to another alcoholic, I go, you know, dude, I know you're trying, but this is not going to work unless it's for you. It's kind of like a selfish process in a way. But if your wife's bitching at you or or your family's bitching at you or you're in trouble at work – Consequences mean nothing to an addict. They mean nothing. They just they just spark that defiance in you. I got defiant toward the people who loved me and were trying to help me because it's like, screw you. This is not your life. This is my life. No matter how uh, distorted and crazy it is, you're just like, it's my life and I'll kill myself if I want to. Now get out, you know? Ooh, gives me the creeps thinking about it. <laughs> I can only imagine how hard that is to ditch something that becomes everything to you. You're 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 out. Does the draw of alcohol yeah. ever still pull you in? Um, it took a long time for me, but here's the deal. Going back to our initial conversation about desensitizing yourself to things. It's like my manager with all good intentions, my manager, the other guys in my band, they tried to sort of um, set up a scenario where I could function and produce in a very controlled environment. Now, they were trying to hide me away from – the temptations, sober companions, a sober tour manager, you know, blah, 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 all this nonsense, you know, and I, some people need that. I can only speak for myself. It made me more defiant. It made me want to drink more. It made me want to take more drugs. Like I am not the identified, I became the identified patient, which leads to victimhood in a way. So I had to – now, it took a while because I am an addict and I, you know, and I always will be. But when it finally got to a point, we were all out at dinner one night and one of the guys in the band was texting one of the other guys in the band, where are we going to go after John leaves? Because they all wanted to go out to the bar and drink. So in that moment, what I did was – I ordered wine for the whole table and I'm like, this is not your problem. This is my problem. Let me deal with it, you know, and that, that may not work for other people, but that's what worked for me because, and, and when I felt uncomfortable, I got up and left and I went back to my room and I called another alcoholic and said, dude, I was just at dinner. Everybody was drinking wine, got a little crazy. And slowly, it got better. I keep liquor in my house. I am always the bartender. I love making drinks. Being a bartender is my true passion in life because it was the greatest job I ever had. Better than being in a rock Get band, it. I swear to God, because because I was shy. I was a shy young man, so I had not. I had a reason to talk to every pretty girl in the bar. I left. I I, I left. My job every night with a with a pretty girl and a pocket full of cash. Being a bartender, it's the greatest job. I highly recommend it to anybody. Well, we know you had no you know? issue uh, with uh, women, uh, pulling pretty women in your life. That that must have been no. another innate skill you have. No. I, I'm uh, secretly jealous of thank you. God for wi- yeah. Thank God for women. No, thank God for women because, like, I, I've been very lucky and, and – 
and women have always been uh, a big source of strength and 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 uh, trouble. <laughs> but 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 uh, like most beautiful things in life, I mean, the women in my life have always been strong and and compassionate, and that that's what I look for in a woman is someone who's who's strong and compassionate and can be a partner. You know, um, you know. Women who have their own identity. I, I'm not afraid of strong women. I, that's what I grew Amen. up with. Amen. The good with the bad, and I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, you, you know, I know you spoke about your wife prior to uh, to us hitting record here, but, you know, I, I found a woman who was very strong-willed, but will break down and cry when she knows I'm, uh, mm-hmm. I'm in pain. And that, that right there, I know means the world to me. But, John, before we get to our, our final questions, and one, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, let's talk a little bit about this album and why you, you are, I mean, four decades of impact on the world through your yeah. music. And you talk about a legacy, you know, there's, there's a time when John, Re, you know, Resnick will no longer be here, but your music will remain. And that's insane to think about that. But I hope so. what is it about this I album that so. you and, uh, you know, Robbie are so passionate about and so excited to, to release into the world? Um, I think that COVID and and all the civil unrest and 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 the struggles for you know whatever we're struggling towards, we're, we're, what are we creeping towards? I believe that there is um, a positive end to this story, but you know, interesting times are not always good times, and. Um, we are being tested on so many levels as individuals, as, as, as Americans, as, as human beings. Um, and when you, and then you, and then you put COVID on top of it and you're trapped in the house and you have a lot of time to think and introspection and that, and, and this, this album is sort of a, uh, it's kind of a reflection on uh, like just being a human being, during this insane time in history, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, there's a little satire on the album because the, I, I, I'm always amazed by the absurdity of celebrity in the year 2022, you know, and probably because of my age, but, but uh, some of it, I'm just like, what, that's what that song. Yeah. I like you is about because it's like, this is, this is what celebrity is now. Wow. 10,000 people like me. Oh, wait a minute. What happens when 2,000 people like me? What happens when more people don't like me than like me? It's like you're, you know why they call it self-esteem? Because it comes from yourself. It's not, you cannot get caught up in other people's opinions of you. It's like my, my favorite alcoholic in the world said this to me. Your opinion of me is none of my business. And it's like, I love that. Oh, man. my wife says the uh, the same thing, man. Yeah. I'm taking notes. That that right there, interesting times are not always good times. That I think you just named this podcast, man. That yeah. uh, or this this episode that that is so true. But you have to believe as human being, we are moving towards, uh, like you said, a beautiful outcome. It, but I, I I think there I think we have uh, some yeah. darker days ahead of us than than sunnier days. But we'll eventually uh, get there. We always seem to figure it out. It- but you know what? You know what? I just wanted to say this. It, it's it's something small. It's very very small, and a lot of people would consider it trivial. But but when I know that people are so divided along all kinds of lines in this country and in the world too, right now. But one of the things that I have been noticing this summer because I've been gone for three years, I've been toured in three years. People leave their differences at the door and we need to find common ground something as stupid as a few songs this guy that girl these all these people from every walk of life they put their differences aside and they come into the arena and find some common ground we need to create a venn diagram in this society where we can all look at that little space where the two circles join. Let's work within here and work, then we'll work our way out. 
because we need to we need to love each other and be respectful of our differences. You, you said uh, the word empathy mm-hmm. uh, earlier in the podcast, and, and empathy has almost become like the uh, the new hot buzzword. But people are not displaying empathy. Empathy means yeah. you, you listen to people's perspectives and their experiences no. because they're entitled to them, because their life experiences are different than yours. And yeah. try to still find that commonality with people. We yeah. we we love to to put buzzwords out there, but mm-hmm. yet we don't follow them through behavior or action. What t- tell no. me about the tour, man? Where, no, where what are what are some of the highlights of the uh, the tour? Which you guys have already started, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, we got to play at Red Rocks up in Colorado. Oh, I, I went Have to Colorado been? for school. Love the Red Rocks, man. Had I known you guys were playing there, oh, we, okay. we would have come out, my wife and I. Oh, well, you know, you Thanks, are sorry. always welcome when we come back, you know, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just great to be able to connect with our audience again, you know, because that, that, like, they're a tribe too. Like, there are these uh fans of our band who they get together they meet from all over the country and they get together and they come to a few shows together and they've they've had these friendships that developed and 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 i'm like that's so cool that they bonded over something and then and you know it and then you see their faces you start to recognize faces in the crowd and and they become an extension of your tribe when when, uh, when does the tour go till you know um, this tour, this leg of the tour goes until the 24th of September. And, um, and then we're picking up in the fall. We're going to do, uh, a theater run in smaller cities across America. And then, um, I don't know. Then I think we're going to go to South America. Okay. Um, Australia. if people want to find the dates and locations, where, where, where can they go? Is it Google, Google dolls.com? Uh, Google. Okay. Yeah, googledolls.com okay. would well, probably be the best My place. wife and I will go take a look at that, and hopefully yeah. we will find a way to make one of the uh, the shows. Hey, dude, I've always wondered this. Never, never – I, I equate doing tours for you guys to, like, tours in, in the military. Are you guys freaking wore out by the end of the tour? Um, yeah. It's broken sleep on a bus. Um, you know, inconsistent food. Uh, you know, just things like that. It's like really trying to, and I'm getting older, so it's kind of like, oh man, just give me that bed. But um, it's 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 exhausting, but but it is it is fun, you know. And, I mean, and it does take discipline. And it's like, I gotta yeah. get up. I gotta go to the gym every day. You know, I guess that's part of being an everyday warrior. You got to do the things you got to do. And it's like, you know what? You do them not only for yourself, but you have to keep other people in mind. It's like you were saying, which is really brilliant. It's like if you're living your life in service, not only to your country, but to the people who surround you and support you, you know, and I, you know, and I look at the guy who's hanging the steel above my head every night. And I thank that guy because if that, if, if I don't support him and say thank you and sh- express my appreciation, you know, it's like, you know, what he does is very important because that shit could fall on my head and kill me. But he's doing a great job. So how can I support you? You know, because yeah, you're I, supporting I don't me. care if you are a professional athlete that has made it in, in an individual sport, like let's say singles tennis. You are there because people have enabled and supported and coached and mentored you. Uh, yes, you probably have innate talent, but everywhere I've been, all my success, the product to who I am has always been coaches and mentors. I, I just find it so fascinating to talk to you because it's like, and I can't wait to read your book because um, it, it sounds like like a like a tonic. Like it sounds like. Yeah, we all. It sounds like a very loving kick in the ass. <laughs> well, it, it, it is. So you know, one thing people rarely know about me is I come from San Francisco, which is uh, it was a great place, eighties, nineties. Right now, they they have their problems. They will find a way yeah. back. Hopefully, I, I have to believe that. But it was one of the most accepting places yeah. to grow up. You know, eighties, nineties. If you said you were gay, nobody cared. Like, all right, man, come here, throw their arm, right on, man, and. and there, there are different yeah. elements across yeah. the uh, the nation, different environments that, that are not as accepting. Um, so the one thing with this book is I wanted to make it 
very inclusive of it doesn't matter who you are, sex, gender, sexual orientation. Uh, it, it applies to everyone. And hopefully we, we've achieved that. But, John, we, we end this with a series of what yeah. we call the hard questions, man. And, and we, we did send you to prep. So first uh, one is biggest yeah. regret of your life. And here we do not accept I have no regrets in, in my life. Everyone has a regrets. The biggest regret in my life, and I thought about this. I was I was in the gym yesterday, and I was thinking, like, the biggest regret in my life. And I'm just like, wow, there are a lot, you know, small ones and big ones, you know. But, but um, you know, wow, I, I regret. It can't be something like, oh, I regret I didn't talk to that really beautiful woman 30 years ago, whatever. It's, that's bullshit. My biggest regret is that I – I wrote an album and an executive at the record company refused to accept it, but he couldn't tell me why, you know, and I, and I let him get in my head. I let him get in my head and it caused me to spiral down. I let some, I let myself spiral down because of someone else's opinion of me. Now, this is someone's opinion who, if they didn't like the record, it wasn't coming out. This guy was theoretically in that circumstance, my boss. But I, and I just finally, I got to a point where I was just, I had to, for my own survival, go put the record out or drop me because I can't live like this anymore. Like, I can't. And you got to have the balls to walk away from any situation. If it's not right, oh my God, I'm going to lose my fame. I'm going to lose my status. I'm not going to be cool and important anymore. Screw that. It's ruining my life thinking about what this person's opinion of me is. It's And it's stalling me out and it gave me writer's block and all this. And, and then once again, it was just, it felt so good to just go, I'm done. If, 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 if you don't see it, okay, I got to walk away. That my biggest regret was stalling my creativity out because you have to trust your instincts as well as accepting advice. You need to balance it all out. And I did. No, no, that is got, a and great I, story. And I definitely ahead, put that in the question. bucket of moral courage. That took a lot of moral courage to do that and, and hold your head high. Mo moral courage is uh, there's a deficit in this world. Physical courage. That's easy, dude. That, that that's really easy. Uh, biggest or yeah. hardest decision you've ever had to make. Yeah. Probably ending my first marriage, that was, that was probably the hardest decision I ever had to make, you know, because, because of circumstances surrounding our relationship, it, it, the, the situation just became untenable. And, and it was like, we were not, we were growing apart and we were doing, we weren't doing good for each other anymore. So it was, but yeah, see this. Wait, walk away. do you think timing was a factor yeah. in that? Just sitting your timing in life where you guys uh, were at in, could have been a, a factor. I I think yeah I think I, I think our our lives were just just going in different directions, but we were getting further and further apart. And there was always a great still the love. There was a lot of love, and we stayed friends for a long time um, after that. Uh, but we just weren't good for each other anymore. You know? I, I need somebody yeah. who's going to be good yeah. for me. And I and, need to and be I've good been for in that um, Okay. Next one is what are those like one to three tenants? Those, those keys for success for you that you, you've tried to live your life by. And usually if you follow them with discipline, uh, you know, usually lead to good outcomes. Try to keep your word. I don't always, I, I, you can't always keep your word, but you do your best to keep your promises and keep your word, um, you know, and honor your commitments um, keep your ego in check, you know, like in my, in my, in my situation, it's like, if my ego gets involved in the process of writing a song, then it's going to turn out to be crap. You know, you got to do what's best for the song anyway. Um, you know, and, and, and when you are going to fail, but you just keep going. Those are powerful, That's man. Really uh, keep your word. You know, Sammy Hagar said something very similar to, to, to us in his interview. He, he called it, don't fuck anyone or don't try to fuck anyone. He said, try, try to follow your word. He said, yeah. sometimes things oh, happen no. where 
uh, someone gets, as he said, fucked, but uh, it was never his intent. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And yeah, I love him. I love Sammy Hager. Like, I've never met someone who's got so much joy. And I'm going to say this dude, that for guy. his age, he looks freaking good. Like, he, he, he looks figured it out. freaking great. He looks amazing. And he still drinks tequila. Wait, wait you know, that guy, <laughs> he, he has written books. That guy has the uh, the secret sauce to uh, to life. I'm uh, I'm convinced. All right, last question, man. When all he said does. and done and your time has come, how are you going to know you lived a life of impact? Or what would you have wanted your legacy to be? I I think we, we, we hit on this before. I, I just hope that I left my little corner of the world just a little bit better than I found it, you know? And, and, um, and I hope that my daughter respects me. You know, that's mostly it. I hope my daughter loves me and respects me in my and last brother, moment. I have no doubt that she will, if you continue to give her advice like that, is have your dream, but you got to work for it. Um, well, John, dude, um, I have loved this conversation, man. I, and I mean that with all authenticity whatsoever, man. I wish we Me had too. three or four hours uh, sitting down in person because we could keep going. And there's a lot I can learn from you, man. And there's a lot that people will learn from your advice in this well, podcast. It's a lot we Absolutely. learn from each other. There's a lot we can learn from each other. That, that you know, I'm, you know, I. Likewise. Much Likewise. You, and, uh, much hey, respect. you know, I do remember. And I know it's your most iconic song, uh, Iris, but we were sitting on a hide site in the Marines. I was a recon Marine in my initial days in the military, and we were stuck on a desert hill for two weeks overlooking the vastness of the desert. And uh, your song probably came on more times. Uh, and I was joking with one of my old recon buddies is we, we had a little, uh, you know, radio receiver with a little speaker. And uh, he's like, dude, I remember that song coming on uh, way too often. But uh, we I attached that memory, as wow. I said earlier, wow. to sitting in uh, desert. Uh, oh God, I'm forgetting. It's the desert of California, man. So you've had impact. And uh, I can't, we, I'm going to go look at GooGooDolls.com and, and find the dates, man. Well, hopefully we can join you for one of your shows. John, I wish you a safe travel on the rest of the tour, man. And thank you for your time. No, thank you, brother. And for all those, thank you for listening. Uh, again, like I said, go to GooGooDolls.com. Check out the dates. Go to a show. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this, uh, this new album. And guys, thank you for joining the Everyday Warrior. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast. Hey, whatever platform you utilize to listen to our podcast, please, please leave a review. We read all of them. That's how we get better. And lastly, again, thank you to our sponsor, Pendleton Whiskey. We've got your six. Cheers.